time for the double stop with Brian Sword. Welcome to the double stop. I'm Brian Sword. This week on the show, I have bassist Gabe Rosales. Now, outside of George Lynch fans, you may not have heard the name, but he's got a great story, which is why I wanted to get him on the show. Gabe was in the much maligned smoke this era of Lynch mob, don't hold that against him, in the late 90s, and then went on to play with pop artists like Jennifer Lopez. Then his addictions kind of got the best of him, and he had some hard times. But I'll let him tell you about that part. But then he got cleaned up, got into activism, and then did a solo record called Vital Nonsense, reconnected with Lynch a couple years ago, and is in the new documentary Shadow Nation with him. He's also on the newly released double album soundtrack for The Doc. Gabe's got a great story, and I'm really glad to have him on the show. I think you guys are going to really enjoy this one. So let's get right to it. Here is my chat with Gabe Rosales. I grew up in San Juan Capistrano. Uh, that's in uh, Southern California, like Orange County. And it's pretty much a predominantly uh, like Latino, Mexican, um, like little, little uh, town. It's, it's got actually the place where, in California, it's known because of where the, the swallows go. These, these birds fly back to the mission. So it's got actually a lot of history. It's, this mission's been there since like the 1700s. So it's like, it dates back even to like before the Declaration of Independence and stuff. Um, so I grew up around there and my parents are both Mexicans. And uh, my dad came over from Mexico, so he's, you know, actually I'm first generation um, from him. Uh, and, he, you know, they were into, like, and my mom played folklorico, which is, like, uh, traditional, um, you know, uh, folk music from, from uh, the Mexican culture. And so, she, but then she tuned her guitar, you know, by herself. She'd do it by ear, and she played a nylon string. And so she'd sing and play these, like, little folk tunes, and my dad would accompany her. And... Uh, and, you know, and then try to do backups and stuff like that. So they, they were always playing, you know, and they, but she'd play James Taylor tunes, you know, and she was into the police. I remember when I was a little kid, man, she'd, she'd play me that. I mean, she made me sit down and listen to Synchronicity, uh, Synchronicity 2. And she also made me sit and watch Pig Floyd, The Wall, the actual movie. So, I mean, she was, you know, I mean, she had her musical, you know, uh, uh, taste together. And she definitely influenced me in terms of, you know, having the cultural stuff as well as having uh, um, the more, you know, the rock, the whole rock vibe and the classic, just the classics, you know what I mean? So it was cool. It had a kind of a mixture of both things going on. Um, and I, you know, I had a piano in my house, so I kind of come home. I remember like through elementary school, I come home and kind of play and mess around with it a little bit. Um, and, and I started developing my own pieces. Obviously I didn't know what the heck I was doing. I was just pushing buttons, you know, but I found what I liked. And so I created this whole epic saga. And I mean, that lasted all the way up to when I actually started getting serious with music when I was about 13. And then what was your first serious instrument? Um, well, seriously, like a, a bass guitar is like what I've pretty much had. And that, I mean, I've been focused on just because uh, I was originally going to be the singer of a death metal band. You know, I was getting trying to figure out where my position was in the world, you know, the teenage angst thing. And, you know, I was wearing a black <laughs> trench coat and stuff like that with metal boots. And, and at first, it's kind of funny, actually, this is a funny story. Uh, um, my, my girlfriend at the time, she, she was telling me about this band called Carcass. And she's like, they're ex-medical students and they, you know, all they sing about is like medical terminology. And, and so we were in like Sam Goody, you know, like a record store, I mean, crazy back in the day, one of those record stores. And, um, <laughs> yeah. isn't that crazy? And, uh, you know, I was obsessed with the band Faith No More too. Um, and so I found out Mike Patton, the singer of Faith No More was, you know, came from his original band was, a, a Mr. Bungle. And so, uh, I saw Mr. Bungle had a release and then also Carcass was right next to it. So I bought both those tapes actually. And, and I bought the carcass CD, I mean, or, uh, the tape as a joke, just to, you know, because she's like, really, you're going to listen to that? I'm like, yeah, why not? And at first I was terrified because you know, these guys were growling and stuff like that. And it was the heaviest music I'd ever heard in my life. It terrified me. And Mr. Bungle was the whole, you know, opposite end of the spectrum. It was just ridiculous musicianship, um, but just almost like schizophrenic, bipolar, uh, attention deficit music where it would change genres within seconds. You know what I mean? I don't know if you guys yeah. are familiar with Mr. Bungle or not. Oh, yeah. But, uh, of course. Yeah, it's just really out through the first album, you know, so it was just so out there. And that kind of sent me on like a whole other thing because the lead, the cover of the album was this, um, was taken from this comic book, uh, uh, um, 
a syndication called uh, Beautiful Stories for Ugly Children. And that just sent me on a whole other thing, too, of like just getting into comic books and art and stuff like that and just really twisted things. So um, I, I started listening to this death metal band, Carcass, and then I started writing these lyrics, and then I became the singer of this death metal band, um, and they didn't have a bass player. And so they had a drummer and a guitar player, and I needed to fill in that void. And so, you know, moving on from the heavier stuff, Carcass and the DSI and Cannibal Corpse, and I found these other bass players that were, you know, um, singing and playing. And so I was like, okay, I might as well do it myself. So I took the bass home. My, my drummer friend of mine had it. Uh, I took his home. He had it sitting around. It was like this old rusty Hondo. And um, it's crazy. And then just kind of mess around there for like three or four months. And then we started rehearsing. And then we did our first show within like probably about five or six months after I started playing. And, you know, it was just a bunch of covers. But it was uh, something that stuck with me. And, and then, you know, kept building on that. So that's like 14 years old. You started playing shows? Yeah, yeah. When I was 14, like my first, the first show was what we did a, a talent show at my junior high school, like eighth grade talent show. And, <laughs> you know, and I'm singing like <laughs> deicide lyrics, dude, and like Sepultura and Slayer. <laughs> And, uh, I mean, it was ridiculous, you know I mean? Cause and you know what? I also had a, I had an octave pedal on my voice. So it dropped my voice down even lower. So I was like, <laughs> you know, it just sounded ridiculous. And all the kids nice. came to the front of the stage, of course. And the parents were just terrified and were so bummed, you know, I was having up to down cross and it was just it was ridiculous. Um, but, uh, you know, it was fun. And it was like the first, you know, getting me the whole situation of playing live. And then we played, you know, at the high school later to, um, at my, cause the drummer was in high school at the time. So we played at the high school during lunch and, and all that stuff. But then, you know, it just mutated, man. Just started listening to other styles of music, and that totally expanded the vocabulary. And then when did you get deep into bass then, when, when, uh, when you, after you started playing shows? Um, well, I, I started, like, really studying it. I think, well, actually, probably when I was about 14. Because there was another yeah. bass player that was playing at the high school, and he knew how to slap. I didn't know how to slap. I was playing with a pick, and so I was just like, okay. You know, I'm like, well, this sounds cool. Like, I had no idea even what to do, you know? And so I started watching what he did, and um, he was like the, the shredder guy at the high school at the time. This was up in Santa Cruz. This is Northern California, actually, because my parents had gotten divorced when I was like eight years old. So my mom went back to college. She went to UCI first, then she went to UCSC. And uh, she took me with her. So I was living in Santa Cruz. This was all, um, you know, like I was marching around downtown with all the, the homeless guys and gangbangers. And <laughs> it was just a scene up there. Like Santa Cruz was a trip back in the day. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, I started really getting into – you know, Red Hot Chili Peppers, obviously Flea was a big, you know, influence. And, um, and that was actually probably the, the main one that was getting me into other styles of music. I'm, oh, and I discovered Primus, of course, Les Claypool, of course, um, while I was up there. And, you know, and that was just a whole other thing. I had no idea what he was doing and he was making these weird sounds and playing six string fretless and his bass was all weird. And, and, uh, and so, yeah, you know, it was like, that was the whole thing, man, is when I started really getting into it there. But actually I, started butting heads with my mom. She told me I had to leave. She came out of the house when I was like 14. Um, so I moved back down to the Southern California with my dad. And, um, and when I first moved back down, I didn't know anybody. So literally from, for an entire summer, I, I played, I seriously would wake up about eight o'clock in the morning and then I'd play till about maybe about 11 or, or midnight. You know what I mean? Like straight, like I was getting like 16 hours of practice time uh, for months. Like in almost every single day, you know, I'd stop to eat and be at one or two in the afternoon and then I'd, and I'd keep going. It was just like huge, huge shedding time. And I think that's probably when I made like some of the most progress. Um, cause I was living and breathing music. I was buying bass magazines. I was buying, uh, uh, instructional VHS videotapes and watching them religiously and then working on my thumb technique and, and listening to Steve Ray Vaughn, listening to Rage Against the Machine. Um, I'm trying to think of other stuff. And I'm, you know, I was get, kind of getting into that whole the uh, street, you know, hip hop gangbanger thing too. So I was listening to like old funk stuff like Zap and Cameo and stuff like that. Uh, and that was a whole other spectrum, you know what I mean? Like of, of bass playing of just simplicity, super tight pocket groove stuff, which was way different than any of the metal stuff that I've been playing, you know. And were you also checking out guys like Jacko and Stanley Clark and those guys? Or was that, did, yeah. did that come later? Yeah, that came a little bit later. Like when I was like probably about seventeen or eighteen, I had this drummer that I was playing with this funk guy, Max Vega. He was, um, and he basically schooled me on all that stuff. And because he wasn't a metal guy, I mean, in my high school in Laguna at the time, there was a, uh, um, you know, it was cool too because everybody there were so many different kinds of bands. There was the whole reggae vibe. You know, living close to the beach, you have that whole Rasta reggae culture, the whole stoner thing. You know, which is mixed with the Hawaiian thing too you have these surfer guys being like yeah you know Irie Eitz man and Shaka Bra and all this stuff you know so they're mixing these different ideas together and then you had metal guys who are also surfers 
And then you have these, you know, these, these elite jazz guys that are just like, oh, I won't, I refuse to play anything other than jazz, you know. And then, <laughs> and, you know, I mean, you know, the whole scene, like, there's just like yeah. a little different little clicks and stuff like that. Um, but the the funk guy that I was playing with, he he got me into, you know, he's like, you got to check out some Weather Report, man. So, you know, we started listening to, he he got me listening to Weather Report and Cameo, and 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 I really wasn't into Stanley Clark at all, like to be honest. Not till later, till like I was like maybe twenty or something, I started listening to him. It was mainly Jocko and and you know Herbie Hancock's bassist from all his different albums, you know, from Mr. Hands to his first uh, Secrets, his first Secrets album, which was like seventy two or something like that. Um, so I was listening to you know Jerry Jamont and uh, Jocko and Larry Graham. You know, I was listening a little bit to Larry Graham too. Um, but it was yeah, the fusion guys is, is uh, Jocko was my, my my main guy that I was just blown away by. I couldn't even believe he's doing what he's doing. And it sounded like you were kind of hanging out with a bunch of different groups of people also and getting a bunch of different musical influences that way. Yeah, I mean, it definitely like a I I, I enjoy hanging out with different people because I was I mean I was just, seriously like it was crazy like I I um I just love music you know what I mean so I'd find something that I, I could latch onto that I could relate to and I could find these different correlations within the music the the metal stuff that I was listening to. I mean I think Meshuga is one of the funkiest bands in the world. Um, you know, but, you know, I tell some metal guys that, and I'm like, funk, what the hell's the matter with you? You know what I mean? Like, I put it up there with, like, like Parliament or something, you know, because the feel is so funky. Um, but it's, you know, obviously they're playing, like, eight-string guitars. They don't even have a bass player anymore, I don't think. It's just this, all the gen stuff, you know. It's a trip, man. But, yeah, I mean, you know, it's like, I feel like, especially as a bass player, if you want if you want to work, man, you got to be able to play a bunch of different stuff. That's true, yeah. So after those years of extreme practice, what was the first kind of break for you musically? Um, well, I I was always playing in different bands. I, I ended up, you know, with one of the death metal bands I was playing with at the time, uh, Beyond Seven. We we ended up, you know, opening up for like Obituary and playing with these death metal bands that I grew up listening to. And then um, it's so crazy too. I mean, it really is like my life is like a, it's a testimony to just it's almost like Forrest Gump, dude. Like being at the right place at the right time. You know, you happen to be in the background while somebody's giving an important speech and then they're like, Hey, who's that guy? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> um, seriously, it's crazy. The, the, the singer of one of the bands that I was playing with at the time. Um, well, first of all, like I, I was, you know, I was playing this death metal band and we were writing the most intricate complex songs. Sometimes it was hard to even find a drummer to play the stuff because it was just so ridiculous with this friend of mine, Alec. Um, and then at one point, we, like the amount of stress that it was causing us was just, we were got so over it. They were like, let's just write, cool stuff like Rage Against the Machine, groovy riffs, and just do whatever the heck we want and just have fun. And as soon as we changed our mindset like that, we wrote probably about 10 songs in two months. And the lead singer of the band, this is the weird part, he was a he was working at a pharmacy in, our, in, in town, and the manager of the pharmacy's son-in-law happened to be a producer for Madonna. Um, he worked with Joan Baez. He worked with CNC Music Factory, he worked with Hall Notes, this guy Paul Pesco. Um, and he, you know, eventually he did, you know, recent most recent stuff he's done, you know, co wrote a bunch of Daryl Hall records and and uh, he was a light of Daryl's house and stuff like that. And um and so he kind of took a liking to us. She the and the the manager of, of this pharmacy, she's like, Oh, you got a band, you know, talking to the lead singer of my band. Like, well, I'll send my my son in law to go just for your rehearsal and see what he thinks, you know. If he likes you guys, maybe he'll record some of your music. So he came up, watched us, fell in love with the band, fell in love with all of us. You know what I mean? We hit it off. He's like, you know, at this time, he was probably like 35 years old or something like that. Um, and then he decided he was going to produce us. So we started working in the studio that recorded, you know, Sublime recorded their first album in L.A. Um, and this is when we were like 17, 18 years old. So this was like a big deal to us, you know. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and we were recording the tape, too, man. It was like before the whole Pro Tools movement. I mean, we still were using Pro Tools, but they were, we were recording the tape. So we had to play it right the first time. Um, which is a trip, man. Cause like, you know, everything's totally changed now. Uh, <laughs> yeah. and you know, I mean, you know the way it is, it's just, it's totally, oh, I mean, yeah. within months, you know, with like technology becomes obsolete. Um, uh, and so he became the guy, you know, and, and that band fizzled off, but I became really close to him and he kind of took me under his wing, like his little brother. And when he started producing other things, you know, he kind of brought me in on it, you know, Hey, I got this young bass player, you know, give him a chance kind of thing. And, that's when I got, you know, he produced Smoke This album, which um, when he met up with George Lynch. And at first he was getting the singer of my band uh, to sing on it. And then, you know, George listened to our recording 
And he's like, oh, well, that bass player sounds good, too. Whatever, maybe we should get him as well. You know, Paul Wernsley was going to play bass on it, but then, you know, the singer of my band, uh, this guy Jimmy at the time, he was, uh, um, he said, yeah, well, have Gabe try out. And so I came in, and so it didn't work out with the singer, but I stayed on the gig. So I ended up recording on Smoke This, and this was when I was, like, 19. This was, like, maybe about a year after I graduated high school. And what kind of audition then? Like, so George heard your your recordings, but what was the audition like for it? You know what? To be honest, it was it was just kind of like, um, I, I I went out to Arizona. I flew out to Arizona. I he put us up my, myself and the singer up in this hotel, and you know it was. I mean, that was one of those those debacle times too. You know, I was still drinking a lot of the time. And, but I still was doing my homework. We had a little four track and he'd send us ideas. We had a little ta- ideas on tape and I'd write parts to it. And so, uh, I was writing parts and he liked the parts that I was coming up with. We'd show up at rehearsal the next day and bust it out. And it just clicked, man. And beyond that, like, you know, me being 19 and I, I happened to look like, like George's son, Sean too. So, <laughs> and, and George's son, Sean was there. And so we looked like we were all big family. Yeah. I looked like a Sean was right. my brother, you know? And, um, and so George and I hit it off and the parts that I was writing, he loved. Um, and then some of the stuff that I was writing too affected how he was approaching his, the song, you know, himself. And so we were just like really feeding off each other, like fantastically. And, um, and so then I ended up staying on the gig, but the singer ended up getting sent home because he just wasn't cutting it. He wasn't like, uh, uh, come up with parts fast enough. And, and so then, uh, and then I stayed on it and we got another singer and then that was it, man. And we recorded smoke this album. And, and that was like, that was the beginning of, of uh you know went on tour and that was when i was like i turned 21 on the road with, with lynch mob man <laughs> it's crazy and how familiar were you with lynch when you joined the band were you already a fan or did you not really know his stuff i didn't really know his stuff just because of you know the the kind of scene that i was in i was into like really heavy you know cannibal corpse suffocation um i mean when it came to metal you know what i mean and pantera and stuff like that i wasn't really listening right. to like the more virtuoso uh, singer, you know, almost like Queens or Ike, you know, I mean, like, especially the, the whole Dawkins days, like I never really listened to Dawkins, even though I'd heard, um, his parts. Cause he's, I mean, he writes these phenomenal, like monumental parts. I had heard all the, those songs before, but I didn't know it was him. And then of course, like seeing his instructional videos everywhere. Um, I, I was familiar with his name and I was familiar with him, but I wasn't familiar with like, you know, it, it, his whole repertoire and Lynch Mob and stuff like that. So, um, you know, obviously when, I started playing with him. I had to learn a bunch of Lynch Mob tunes. And, uh, you know, and then we changed some stuff up too, which did not go over well with fans, you know, like playing tooth and nail halftime and having somebody <laughs> rap over it. People got very angry, very angry. Well, yeah, obviously we got to cover that, man. So Lynch was obviously trying to reinvent himself at that point. Uh, mm-hmm. That was, you know, the style of that record, which I have here. And I do, there's a lot of it I do like. And, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and, and I actually do defend it. So, um, good. Well, thank but, you. I appreciate it. You're one of the few. We almost had to fight like every single, seriously, dude. Like sometimes, like, especially through the Midwest, like it was like people were pissed. We almost had to get in fights at the end of shows and stuff like that, you know? Well, my first question is in terms of the music, as he was an older guy kind of trying to reinvent himself and what was kind of cooler currently. What did you think of the music that he was coming up with? The you mean the the new stuff that we were writing? Yeah. Oh, I mean, I, I loved it. I mean, especially with the the new singer that we got. We got this guy from this band called Oil, this guy named Kirk Harper, and he had. I mean, he was watching him perform. He was like seriously one of my favorite front men I'd ever seen before. Like he had the screaming capacity of Phil and Selmo. He had the vocal range and and melodic you know, prowess of like, of Mike Patton, my favorite singers. And then he could rap like Snoop Dogg. And th- I mean, he could throw down. I mean, the guy was phenomenal across the board. Um, so the stuff that we were writing with George was just like, I, I loved it, to be honest with you. Like it was, and every song was different. And the thing with, with um, you know, I, I think, you know, a lot of people think that George was trying to find his voice. Like, or, or but the thing was, is like George listens to all styles of music. Like he listens to so many different kinds of artists you know, stuff that I never even thought that he would, I could picture him listening to. And I think he was just kind of like, you know, he wanted to just experiment and just, you know, like he wanted to have the opportunity to play things that he'd never played before. Um, you know, but the, the whole thing is, is, you know, I mean, I noticed this is actually what taught me a lot too at a young age, um, was that if you're kind of pigeonholed in one place and people expect that of you, it, it's really hard to break out of that. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. Um, it, it's, it's almost like sacrilegious to a lot of people, you know? Yep. And uh, they don't want to, they don't want to hear it. Like, so 
um, I feel like George was, I mean, that's more like smoke. This album was a lot more George than some of the other stuff that he does. You know what I mean? Uh, I think in terms of, um, of where, you know, his musical tastes go, like he is so diverse and like in that way. But, uh, I mean, I, I would totally enjoy the stuff that he was writing and the stuff that we were coming up with. And I mean, I turned him on to Meshuga. He'd never even heard Meshuga before. And I'm like, you, oh, you never heard Meshuga, you know? And I'm like, I'm like, you got to listen to this, dude, this, this will affect everything. And it did, you know, he changed the, he started, I was like, Oh shit, we can do this. We can do that. Um, so it was cool, man. Uh, I mean, I really enjoyed playing with that band in, in general because I mean, it was just phenomenal. The stage presence and the shows were just so much fun. It's interesting though, because it doesn't matter how good, a frontman and a singer he was that was the problem for fans Mm because you could take that same record you could strip off the vocals you could add a more rock traditional rock singer and people probably would have embraced that record it was oh yeah it all came down to the vocals Mm mm-hmm definitely and yeah i mean i i get it i mean it's the the whole rap rock thing i I always appreciated it like when you know run dmc and aerosmith did their thing uh anthrax public enemy that was ridiculous. Bring the noise was one of my favorite tunes ever. You know what I mean? And like that whole collaboration of, of rock and, and combining those things. Cause I felt like, I mean, a lot of times, you know, uh, uh just that style of vocal can complement really heavy riffs, especially if they're rhythmic, you know what I mean? Cause really words are just, I mean, it's percussive anyways, you know what I mean? Like, especially in terms of like, uh, you like how many syllables a word has and how people flow over a beat. You know what I mean? Like it, to me, there's just, there's a lot of similarities there. So, it's it's funny and one more thing I got to say about George on that record is that yeah. he took a lot of he took a lot of shit for it and he made yeah. some jokes about it he made some jokes about it but he never apologized for it he always stood behind it Yes no for sure man it, it's cool I mean I think he you know I mean he called it uh, Lynch Biscuit and I mean I called us Lunch Mom for a long time just, I mean but it it was like it, that was mainly just a joke cuz it was fun I mean the guys I love in the band I love to death and it was it was a it was just a, it was a fun time you know what I mean but um, yeah, no, he, you're right. I mean, he never did. And he still likes the tunes. And it's funny because some of the riffs and the notes that he picked in that album, I mean, he still, he's like, <laughs> like with the new shadow train thing, you know, there's a couple of riffs where he's just like, man, I've been playing this riff for the past 20 years. And one of these days, somebody's going to get it. You know, he'll say stuff like that. It's so funny. Yeah. Yeah. Now tell me about the tour. Cause you mentioned a little bit that it was a bit of a challenging tour. What, how was that tour like for that record? Well, you know, I mean, for me, it was my first tour. So I was just, you know, to me, it was all fantastic because I'd never, you know, I had had nothing to compare it to. And I was gone, you know, uh, out of the house, out of the state, you know, come me being 20 years old, you know, this is like brand new thing. And I'm playing with this guitar legend and I'm, you know, and, and I'm enjoying the style of music that I'm playing and the, the venues are cool, you know, and, um, and the band is just a blast, but you know, I mean, I, I drank a lot, like, a it was like being away at college, I guess, you know what I mean? And, and when your only responsibility is to do a sound check and then make sure that you're sober enough to play a show, like I, I it was just a big party for me, you know, the whole time. Um, and so, you know, that, that was like, you know, we went from place to place. I turned 21 on the road. So like after the first week or two of the, sh- of the tour, uh, you know, we ended up in St. Louis, Missouri and I, I turned 21 out there. Um, it's funny too, because, you know, me being 20, like I, I, some of the venues we played at, I couldn't be in the venue until we played. I wasn't allowed in the building, um, which is ridiculous. So I'd sit in the bus, you know, which is cool, I guess, you know, <laughs> cause we had a bus, sure. you know, and it was nice. We had this old Prevo and then we also had an Eagle at one point, but the, the Eagle was nice in the Prevo at one point. Um, you know, and we had these different drivers, you know, one guy, uh, we came out and he was, he'd finished, polished off a, a, a 12 pack a Budweiser and before he drove. And so we're like, Oh, sh-, you know, we needed to get a new guy immediately. So we went through a couple of bus drivers, um, and a couple of different tour managers as well. We're trying to figure out the right fit and who would work and who wasn't gonna, who was just, you know, being responsible. Um, but, uh, you know, I mean, it was, it was about a month and a half, I think, you know, um, I got back like a little bit before Christmas, uh, cause yeah, my birthday's in November. So, you know, I think, yeah, I got back at the middle of December or something like that. Um, and, you know, I got to see all over the, you know, the country and just, you know, had a blast. I can't remember a lot of the places we were at, you know, because of alcohol, you know, and, you know, obviously at the end of, at the end of the show, everybody wants to buy you a shot, you know what I mean? And you end up drinking with some random people and then, you know, you stumble into the bus and then you wake up to in the afternoon at the next state, you know what I mean? The next place and there's snow everywhere and you're like, okay, where the heck are we now? You know, um, <laughs> it was, I mean, it was a crazy, it was a crazy learning experience, you know, and it was high energy and, and, and I was playing heavy music and, you know, we had a great light guy. The, our light guy was originally out with, um, 
you know, Sepultura before and, uh, you know, the, um, and the roadies were fun too. You know what I mean? All those guys that came out. And so, I mean, it was, it was a trip, man. It was, it was definitely a learning experience and I, I had a blast and I'm being the youngest guy. Um, you know, everybody kind of treated me like their little brother. So, I mean, I have nothing but fond memories of what I do remember. <laughs> <laughs> and before yeah. we move on, before we move on, was there any particular reworking of an old Dawkins or Lynch Mob song that you particularly liked? Well, I mean, I to be honest, I like that reworking of Tooth and Nail, um, the halftime thing, you know, dan 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 dan, you know, and it was usually it's dead epicent, you know what I mean, but instead it was bad dan dan dan. And he's like, oh, you know, he starts rapping over it, and because like I was, you know, I had a five string, so I'm playing the low B, um, and it just, you know, obviously the 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 that pushes so much air, that string pushes so much air, and it was just this simple, almost like brutal tribal, uh, uh, you know, bass line with the with the drums, with somebody rapping over it, and that probably, that was so heavy. And eventually, at the end of the song, we you know we ended up playing it the regular way. You know, um, but that was that was a lot of fun because of just the energy we went into. It. Plus, you know, you got to imagine with the light show and the lights that this guy had. He had these huge strobes behind us, so on these really, you know, heavy moments like that, he would just be flashing it. So all you could just see was silhouettes and this white light, and I mean that that kind of thing was, uh, you know, I mean it was just epic, man. It was it was a blast. Um, I, I mean, I enjoyed that, even though you know, as soon as we started playing that, we'd start getting the middle finger in the front row immediately. You know. What I mean? <laughs> <laughs> You know what I mean? So it was a trip, man. It was definitely, you know, and for me being a kid, I'm like, what's, what's your problem? You know, there's a bunch of older guys that are expecting something out of Lynch. And I'm just like, I'm like, this is fun. Listen to this, just listen to the song. I mean, forget about what you expect of what this person does. Listen to the song, you know what I mean? And, uh, but you know, obviously nobody's hearing that. So it's all good. I mean, you know, you live and learn. Now what happened after the tour? Did the band dissolve right away or was there expectations to do more? Well, we were talking about doing some other stuff. Like George and I started writing, um, you know, I started just playing bass on some other ideas that he had and we started kind of formulating stuff, but yeah, I mean, it was kind of, um, you know, the it, people were just heading different directions and, and, and obviously like after that whole thing and, and, and the reality of being on the road and what people wanted and stuff like George, I think felt like he needed to, you know, put out something else that was a little more geared towards what people were expecting of him. You know what I mean? Um, and so that kind of left me, you know, like, like, you know, whatever. I, I thought we were going to be going back out again, maybe doing some more shows, maybe put out another album as that band. But, you know, that didn't happen. So, it, it, yeah, it kind of dissolved pretty quick after, like, within probably a month or two after we got back off tour. Um, and, you know, but, and I, and, you know, I kept in touch with George for a little bit, you know, but then we really, we lost touch for a while. We we didn't talk for, I mean, I'd seen my NAMM show and stuff like that, but, you know, we didn't talk for, I mean, it must have been like eight years or something. So what did you do after Lynch Mob? Um, well, Paul Pesco, you know, the, my, my boy, he, uh, he ended up getting the musical director job for Jennifer Lopez and Jennifer Lopez was at the time, you know, I mean, obviously she's, she's an actress, you know, and I mean, originally she was a fly girl on living color. I mean, that's, you know, and, and, um, you know, and then I, I saw, you know, Selena or I saw the, the, her first acting thing. And, but the thing was, was like, I, I she's freaking hot. You know what I mean? Her, I had her and Salma Hayek all over my wall when I was like 21 years, 22 years old. Um, you know, and she's just gorgeous. And then he ended up being, you know, her musical director. And he's like, how would you like to play bass for Jennifer Lopez? I'm like, Pfft. I'm like, dude, I don't care how cheesy the music is. I'm down. You know what I mean? Like, I don't <laughs> yeah. care. Like I, I'm, I mean, I'm just, you know, whatever, like who cares? Like I, I'm just, I'd love to just hang out and just play whatever. Cause I'm, how hard can the music be? You know, it's pop. Um, and so he got me on one gig you know, just to do that. And they liked the look of that. Cause she had two different bands at that time. She had an East coast band and a West coast band and they loved the look of the West coast band. So then they're like, okay, well we like the look of the West coast band. She's going to do Saturday night live as a musical guest. Can you do Saturday night live? So I'm like, of course I'd will. I mean, that was a dream come true playing in front of millions of people on television. You know what I mean? Um, you know, and then behind this girl, like who's just ridiculously hot that I have ready off pictures of her on my wall. Uh, and so it just, you know, it seemed like a no brainer to me, you know, but it was a totally different situation, obviously, than Lynch Mob. It was a way, you know, more high profile, a lot more money behind it, way more Hollywood cheese, cornball. Um, you know, at the same time, like the musicians, the, the caliber of musicians where these guys are, everybody I was playing with had been around the block in the, that scene, like the pop world and, and corporate, you know, music scene for at least 15 to 20 years before me, you know? And so, um, 
you know, I was playing with some really, really heavy hitters, like some guys that I really looked up to. And, you know, they kicked my ass, man. I mean, you know, I'd play stuff and they'd be like, don't ever do that again. (laughs) (laughs) Stuff like that. And, uh, you know, I mean, that was, that was huge. I mean, I was 22, you know, it was right after lynch mob. And, um, and and so, you know, we, we did the SNL thing and then, you know, sure enough, you know, they go, okay, well, she's going to do a promo tour in Europe doing just promotional uh, for her second album, you know, so can you do that? So I went to Europe with her for about two, three weeks. And then they do, when we did Saturday Live again, you know, um, again, oh, in 2000 wow. and where, where she was the musical director, I mean, the musical guest and she was also the host. All um, right. and so we, yeah, we did the whole thing again and it was kind of cool too. Cause it was a new, newer cast. Will Ferrell was gone by that point. They had some newer people. They had Tracy Morgan and, um, and so I got to do SNL again. So it was the second time and, you know, kept doing that stuff and, and, and just building and, and, you know, meeting new guys in the scene, meeting guys in the LA scene. And, you know, a lot of the dudes that were in her band from the West, I mean, there's a lot of them originally from, you know, I mean, those guys went to Berkeley College of Music, guys from Miami and, and the whole Latin scene down in Florida. Um, and, and so, you know, especially her percussionist, you know, I mean, being Latina, Puerto Rican, East Coast, she had a lot of, you know, classic guys that were, were just badasses behind her too. So uh, I had to really get my, my act together quick in terms of, uh, professionalism, you know, tastiness, tone, I mean, everything. I, I had to really figure out what I was doing. And at that point is when I really, I got like a, to- a jazz tonal harmony book. I started, I had a four track recorder. I started playing, um, you know, I got a real book. And so I started playing the bass parts, like constructing walking bass lines, playing the chords, um, learning the heads and then leaving space for myself to improvise over. And I started recording just, just like a bunch of jazz songs. Um, on a little four track recorded just with bass, like nothing else. I wasn't recording guitar or anything um, that came later. And then, you know, and then eventually I applied all that theory that I knew in the songs that I was learning on piano because I wanted to have some other kind of thing under my belt, um, you know, of just approaching a different instrument and understanding it from a, you know, piano point of view. So I started playing the jazz songs that I knew on bass on piano. And so that really helped out a lot too. And it made me, um, you know, got me up to par on some, on some levels. <laughs> And how long did you play with Jennifer Lopez? Um, that was about two or three years. That, that's quite a long time for that kind of gig. Yeah, no, it's funny you say that. Yeah, it is. It, it really is. I mean, the shelf life of musicians in, in the corporate world, especially, you know, how fickle pop stars are going from manager to manager. And when they change managers, you know, inevitably the manager might pick a different musical director that is a friend of his, you know, and then you get shuffled to the side. And that means that the musical director is going to hire all his buddies you know, and so, I mean, that's exactly what happened. You know, she got rid of Benny Medina. She got somebody else. He got a different musical director. The musical director got all his guys. And then, you know, then that was, and that was over. And that was like from 1999 to about 2000, maybe even 2001, I think. But hey, like you said earlier, she liked one band's look over the other. And some other bands lost their gig <laughs> just because of... Oh you know, yeah, that, week she, that yeah. week she wanted a certain look, you know. So it is mm-hmm. it's fickle in, in all kinds of ways. Exactly, and that's I mean, you know, and that was another big learning experience in terms of the corporate world, how cutthroat, how there's no loyalty, how you know, and a lot of times they'll you know they'll get a kid that's just out of you know, I mean, just like any other industry where they exploit cheap labor, they'll get a kid that's just out of music school. Obviously, he wants to get a name for himself and a resume, so he'll be willing to go out on tour for pennies. Um, because it's not like it's really hard music and his look is okay. Maybe they'll be even be lip syncing the gig where it's pre recorded and he won't even be necessarily playing or she won't even necessarily be playing. It's just, you know, the look, um, how little can we pay these people? Um, you know, and can you look, you look good behind on a camera? You know what I mean? Are you young? Do you look like, is there a young band behind this pop star? Cause you know, the obsession with youth and our culture and stuff like that. So, of course. um, yeah, so exactly. So that, I mean, that showed me just like the, just the you know a uh, uh, cutthroat aspect of of that whole corporate world. And after the Jennifer Lopez gig, did you stay in the corporate world or did you branch out in a different direction? Um, no, I mean I, I did. I, I, kept, I kept getting other pop gigs, and because the pop gigs paid really well, you know. I mean, obviously sure. at that time too. This is before they were. Um, this is before they were really, you know, uh, like Napster and, and and the record industry was just done. You know, it was before people, could, you know, record labels could couldn't make money off of selling records anymore. Um, so they, you know, they had these huge budgets for these, these pop stars that were really not doing anything. I mean, it was just cheesy. Like I played with this one dude. Um, I'm not going to name his name. He was a pop guy. He was in a boy band 
and he, um, you know, it's so funny. It was a Columbia road show and we were supposed to do five dates and just do two songs. You know, it was just a showcase of new Columbia artists. And he, this kid refused to rehearse with us cause he wanted to save his voice. And, you know, and so I got paid up front, like, like five grand to do these five shows. And the first show was in Texas. We did the first show and, uh, he came out on stage because he didn't rehearse with us. His voice cracked. He was imme- immediately kicked off the, the show. Um, and, but I mean, man, I got a check up front. So I'm like, okay, cool. I got paid five grand to play two songs, nice. two songs. I got paid five grand to play two songs. It was ridiculous. And, um, you know, and then, and then also just through, because of the whole Lynch connection, you know, Lynch being an ESP guy, um, Paul Pesco was a longtime friend, um, and bandmate of the president of ESP back in New York, like back in the day. Um, I kind of had just a, direct connection to ESP. And I mean, they took, I mean, took me in like family. Like I, those guys are seriously like my, like my brothers, my blood. And they, I mean, they take care of me to this day. Like they're so awesome. Every single one of them. And so Matt, the president, he, you know, when he heard about gigs that needed bass players or something or young guys, he would, he'd recommend me for gigs too. So he hooked me up with this other guitar player, uh, Prashana Swanee, who is a longtime ESP guy. And Prashana at that time was, you know, had, just finished his second record, I think, Duality. And this is like 1999. And so then I met Prashant on the road doing this Columbia Road Show. And then him and I hit it off. And then he, you know, he ended up getting this other pop gig with this artist named Christina Million, who's like, I mean, she's another, she's beautiful, but another, another Disney chick, you know. Um, and then he got me on that. Hey, can you go to Japan? Oh, well, yeah, definitely I can go to Japan. Well, you need to get your passport in line. We're going to go. So then I, you know, that was another tour that I did. And then um, and then, you know, doing Sheena Easton gigs and then what else did I, who else did I play with? Uh, and then through word of mouth, just meeting different artists, you know, and guys like in the rock scene, because I played with Lynch, I met up with this guy, Tilo Methods of Mayhem. He was, uh, he was a rapper for, um, you know, Tommy Lee's Methods of Mayhem oh, project. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so I met him and then the drummer of that band hooked me up with some gigs. That's, you know, um, and I ended up playing in some band with him and I met a bunch of people through them. So it's just really just networking and being available to do things. And I mean, and that took me, you know, playing with anybody from, you know, yeah, Christina Million to, you know, Nicole Scherzinger from the Pussycat Dolls, uh, Finn Dog from Cypress Hill, you know what I mean? Like fat, you know, with Jennifer Lopez, we play with fat Joe and, um, and I just met, kept meeting people and getting these situations where I was like, sometimes the house band for all these amazing artists. So like that, that kept building up my repertoire and, and my, uh, you know, my resume. And I mean, you know, and I, I hadn't even gone to music school. Like, I don't know what the heck I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? I just kind of showed up and like got thrown in the situation and then ended up, ended up like making a career out of it. So, um, but I mean, you know, I'm not complaining at all. It's, it's fantastic. It's like exactly what I wanted to do. It's given me the opportunity to, to, to do other things that I'd want to do as well, you know? And when did you start working on the solo record, Vital Nonsense? Um, that wasn't until 2009. I mean, well, yeah, I started in 2008. I mean, a whole litany of things went down um, because of, I and mean, I can talk about, I can tell you about everything, right? I mean. Sure. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Because that's like my whole, that's like my whole deal really is like who I am now is, um, you know, after Jennifer Lopez, 2003, 2004, 2005, like I, you know, I was consistently drinking and the, my drug use kept going up, I kept using more, you know, harder drugs, you know, cocaine, stuff like that. And then eventually I was started, you know, uh, uh, you know, becoming the middleman for it. You know what I mean? And then people started calling me for it. And this is like, and this is all, you know, I'm playing with local bands. I'm, I'm, I'm still playing music all the time. I'm still teaching, but I, I just was going off the deep end in terms of like substance abuse. And, um, and, you know, and one of the reasons, I mean, I can, I can name you a bunch of things that, that contributed to like this lifestyle, um, you know, coming from an alcoholic family, um, you know, so I guess genetically, like I predisposed or whatever. And then also just, I think having that kind of success, you know, like going on tour and being in that scene when I was so young, you know how like you have like child actors, Drew Barrymore, it's like, they all end up doing a bunch of drugs because it's almost like you're, when you're, when you get that kind of, um, you know, notoriety or you're doing high profile gigs at such a young age, it's almost like, like the drummer from Jennifer Lopez's band told me it's, it's only downhill from here. Um, you know, and, and I, I didn't think much of it when he told me that, but the pressure of, of, 
okay, well, you're young and you're this good now. You better be this good by this age. You know what I mean? And, and oh, well, you're playing with this person. So when you're playing with my gig, like, I'm expecting you to be the most ridiculous bass player there is. There's a lot of pressure that comes with, you know, having any kind of success at a young age. You know what I mean? Especially playing, um, you know, I mean, Saturday Night Live when you're like 22 years old. You know, it's like, and I mean, obviously there's people that are that do it way younger than I do. But still, I mean, I, I, I just kind of fell off the deep end. So, um, and my whole substance abuse drinking, all that stuff led to, you know, jail time. I got a DUI. Oh, I got, wow. you know, yeah, it's crazy. I got uh, all kinds of stuff, man. I got, you know, uh, two um, charges that were what they call wobblers in California where they can go felony or misdemeanors. And both of them were wobblers at one point. And luckily I had a good lawyer and a judge. So as opposed to getting like three to seven years in prison, I got, you know, like three to four months with like anger management, substance abuse classes, um, I mean, a whole bunch of stuff, man. And so that was like in 2007, and that is when I got sober. I, I changed everything. I stopped hanging out with everybody I was hanging out with. I really kind of just changed everything that I was doing. I mean, I had attended meditation schools before where, you know, I go to this meditation school called uh, v- it's Vipassana Meditation, where you go and you're in silence um, for 10 days. You don't eat a meal past noon for 10 days, and you meditate 16 hours a day in silence. Um so I had done that like pretty much right after the lynch mob tour because I needed to kind of get back some bearings. Um, but then, you know, I, I kind of fell off again and it wasn't until like 2007 and getting locked up for a little bit uh, and, and seeing the whole subculture jail life in Southern California and learning um, while I was there. That That's what really, you know, kicked me into high gear and made me realize what I needed to do. And, took my music in a different direction where I felt like I needed to not do pop stuff, not contribute to this lifestyle of just, you know, just using and I mean, and, and not just using drugs, but just consistent, um, you know, like the throwaway culture, like you, you, when something's not working, you throw it away, you know what I mean? Like, a, a, a some, just not a sustainable way of living. And I mean, same thing like with Jennifer Lopez, gig, you know, like loyalty, like there's no loyalty, like exploiting labor, you know, and, and keeping this machine going where everybody's just in this fantasy world of, of just using and not contributing anything positive, not building anything. You know what I mean? Um, and so I got inspired once I got out to write an album, base it on, you know, and then talk a lot about what jail life was like, what sobriety was like, uh, politics, religion, education, um, you know, even death, you know, one of my friends from my metal bands, you know, he died like after one of the best shows we ever played. Um, and so I wrote a song about him and, uh, and so, you know, I, I put it together and I tried to get as many different artists and people on this album as possible. Just my close friends. I mean, I got Steve Perkins from Jane's Addiction on it. I got, you know, uh, the Jimi Hendrix, a hip hop divine styler on it. Um, I got, you know, Paul Pesco, of course, was on it. Prashant was on it. I got, I mean, I just got and a bunch of other hip hop guys and, and, um, people in the rock scene and I got them to contribute to the album, man. And so it was, a, it was a big deal for me to be able, and it was a therapy, you know, to vent and to get my music out there. And I mean, I'm, I sang on it. I rapped on it. Uh, there's a death metal song. I'm screaming and yelling on it and I'm playing guitar and bass, uh, on pretty much everything. And even keys on some stuff, obviously I got drummers. I program drums on some stuff. But, I mean, I did everything myself other than, you know, produce the album. I had my friend Bruce Story and Paul Pesco produce the tunes. But um, that was like, you know, that was the kind of like my entrance into the world that I'm in now, which is a, you know, musician activist thing, you know, education. Um, but, you know, it's just, it's after sobriety, man. I mean, things got like a hundred times better. Like I got these opportunities that, you know, that, that I, I, I'm still like in awe of, you know, it's crazy. At your low point, then, were you still functional in terms of, were you like a functioning addict in terms of the music? Were you still getting good gigs? Or was it at that point where it was affecting the gigs you were getting? Um, I never, yeah, I never, uh, I didn't have a problem keeping gigs other than, you know, like I had auditions with bands, like I auditioned for all kinds of bands. And I mean, it wasn't because I was on, on drugs, it was just because I was kind of flippant with the way I handled it. And I think probably being, you know, either stoned or, or drunk or hung over or something like I didn't take it as seriously as I could have. And, and, you know, that, you know, made it so I didn't, uh, you know, get it. Cause I'd show up late maybe to an audition and like it was over, you know what I mean? Stuff like right, that. Yeah, yeah. And besides like, I'm still like an hour away from Los Angeles. So, 
I mean, I live in Southern California, but I'm, I'm about an hour and a half, an hour away from these auditions. So it, it's, you know, it would take me a little while to get there. I just didn't plan ahead in time. And, and then some stuff I just didn't even want to do, you know, I mean, I, I had this gig once where I auditioned and I got the part and it was a bit, it was a bigger band. And, uh, you know, and then the, the manager calls me up and he's like, okay, well, you, you know, everybody likes you and it's gonna, you know, it's a good gig, but here's the stick, you know, um, you're going to have to wear a mask. <laughs> and I'm just like, uh, okay, what do you mean? He's like, well, you know, each member of the band has like a character that they're portraying and your character is the animal. So you're going to be wearing a mask and you're going to have chains all over you. And I'm just like, I don't know about that. But I, you know. I'm, I'm good. I'm good. You know what? I'll pass on that one. So it's like, I didn't take every gig that, that I was thrown either too. even, even if I did get it, you know what I mean? Cause there's just certain things I just was like, yeah, I couldn't, I just don't want to do that. Like it's not something I want to do. Um, but, uh, you know, it, the, at the lowest point I was really just playing with, I mean, not low, you know, I was playing with local bands and, and writing good music and good songs, but I wasn't, you know, I wasn't doing any high profile gigs at the time. You know what I mean? I wasn't traveling. I wasn't, uh, and, you know, because I was kind of making myself in that situation, you know, like I go to rehearsals and sometimes we don't even rehearse. We just get drunk. Um, and, you know, and like, I mean, this is that whole thing, you know, that that whole other world of local club band, you know, things where you're you're kind of just like, you know, and I was playing with three different bands, a metal band, like a pop rock band and a funk band. So and a fusion band. So it was like, man, it was crazy. It was it was nuts. But, you know, lots of music was created, but really nothing got done in, in terms of, um, you know what I mean, like anything that, that, that pushed me forward, other than just getting practice time in, you know. And when you started doing the solo record then, was it while you were in the process of getting sober and it was, you know, something to focus on during that? Or was it after you are sober and it was like the, the cathartic, you know, get through it psychologically? Yeah. It's the second. Yeah, it was definitely the cathartic. Yeah. It was like the therapy because I had already been, I started it in by 2008. Um, cause I'm like, I have all these songs, I have all these things that I've written and that I haven't used. And I'm like, I, why don't I put out my own album? You know, I mean, I've been writing with people for my entire life. I'm like, and this stuff is, I mean, I, I like it. It's cool. Like I like some of the stuff that I'm writing. Why don't I just put my own album out? I can rap, I can sing, you know what I mean? Like I can scream and yell. Like I used to be the singer of this death metal band. I can write lyrics, you know, and I can play guitar and I can play bass. So let me, um, and gain you know, on some keys too. So I'm like, well, let me just put together what I've got so far. And, and then, you know, I started plugging away. It took me about a year, um, to, to do everything, you know, ended up being, you know, it's like 15, 16 songs. I mean, it was a lot of work, you know, and, and a lot of guest appearances on it too, of course, and trying to get people and getting the right musicians on certain songs and going into the studio and having different drummers record different sessions, you know, and it wasn't as easy as it was now. Like, I mean, or at least I wasn't doing it like that where, you know, somebody just records something and puts it in a Dropbox and sends it over to you and you upload it and then it's there and you just mix it. It was not like that. Um, but, you know, I mean, it, it was a it was a long process. And even to the last minute, man, until even the very last, you know, literally like the last four hours before I had it mastered, like we were mixing. Um, so it, it was crazy, you know. And, and, and the whole thing was, too, like every single song, and it, it's really super eclectic album. It's kind of like in the in the vein of like Old Faith No More, and that's the reason, and specifically, that's the reason why I did it because I learned from, you know, my lynch mob, lynch mob experience. Like, I don't want to be pigeonholed and forced into a certain thing. And you know, I was talking to friends about the different because there's a lot of there's a like a cha cha on the tune, there's a death metal tune, there's a lot of hip hop, there's fusion. There's a, I got Dave Weckl to play drums on a fusion track, um, and so, you know, it, one of my friends told me, hey, maybe you should just release all these like five different groups of songs with different aliases and just put them out like that. <sighs> but I mean, like, you know what I mean? But the thing is, it's like, who's going to, nobody even buys CDs anymore. Nobody cares. They're going to buy a CD. They're going to use it as a coaster. I mean, first of all, they're going to put it in their iPod or whatever, put download the computer or their phone, and then they're going to use it as a coaster. It's going to be a worthless piece of plastic that I spent a bunch of money on. And, um, and nobody cares. Like if they like a song, they're going to download it off of iTunes and then that'll be the day, you know, like nobody's going to download the entire album. Um, so, and then at the same time, like I was thinking, okay, well, I don't want to separate it because if I separate it and I play live, then, you know, people are going to expect these different things. Like I want to play everything live. <laughs> I want to be able to switch between an acoustic Latin cha-cha with just congas and then, and sing and then put that down, have, and then rap over like a funk bass part, you know, with, a, with like a funk band. And then I want to put everything down 
and then scream and yell and, and like just scream at the top of my lungs and play death metal. And then, you know, after that, I'll pick up the bass again and we'll play from fucking weather report tunes and play some fusion. You know, I'm like, why not? Like, I, I, I mean, don't I deserve that? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you know, it's like, I mean, not like an egotistical way, but doesn't every musician deserve to play what they want to play? Like, like, why not? Can not we do that? Like, why, why does it have to be this one thing? So, um, that kind of was like the basis for, you know, uh, um, putting together the whole project. Like, let's do everything. Let's, let's, I mean, I don't care really, to be honest, whether people like it or not, it's therapy and, you know, um, and it's people will like certain elements of every song, I think, you know, and, and that's basically how it's turned out too. So it's been a trip. Yeah. I think you've pretty much described what the listening experience is, was cause I was shocked at the diversity of it. Like mm. from song to song, you just, you know, and after about, I don't know, three songs in, you realize that you, as you're listening to one song, you have absolutely no idea what's going to come next, which is right. very rare these days. You know, mm-hmm. you, you know, like right. you could say something about the old Led Zeppelin records, and even they weren't that diverse. But with most records, you hear the first song. Okay, I I, I know what this record's going to be. Yeah. It's very rare to have no clue what's coming next. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, you know, and it's kind of like I maybe I got that from like Mr. Bungle too. You know, influenced by Mr. Bungle because like I remember listening to the first Mr. Bungle album, and I and it was the, like what you just described. Like I had no idea what was going to happen. Like I had no even even from like literally from like every five seconds. I don't know because there's like moments where there's they're playing a ballad that's like literally 45 BPMs, and then he screams and yells at the top of his lungs right for about three seconds at the end of a song and then it's over <laughs> like that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I mean, and not, but not to be obnoxious. Sometimes I think my pattern goes over the top, but, um, you know, but I mean, in terms of like, just, just styles, you know what I mean? Of music and being able to, uh, yeah. uh, you know, create like that. Tell me about now how you, after all these years reconnected with George Lynch on the new shadow train. In 2010 or 2011. Well, you know, I bumped him, I bumped into him at NAM, like NAM show and stuff like that. Um, and so after all this stuff, I released the album and I get into like, you know, activism and, and get involved in these human rights organizations and um, indigenous people's rights movements and stuff like that and start, you know, going to Occupy LA and, and like reading, you know, I mean, I started really like researching too. And luckily, you know, my, my, my mom and my, my girlfriend, they like really influenced me. And also actually one of my friends from high school, it's so funny too, man, how stuff changes around this guy that I used to buy weed from he joined the army and then he got a degree and, and then he's sitting here, this guy he's by weed from telling me, Hey, you need to go to college. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny. So between my girlfriend, my mom and this dude, they're like, you're sitting around reading two hours a day anyways. Cause I'm sober now by this point, you know what I mean? And, and I'm just sitting around reading all day anyway. So like, why don't you read a book that will like, and then you can like, you know, I mean, just log and say that, you're, you know, you're working towards a degree in something. You might as well, you know what I mean? Maybe you can get financial aid. Maybe you can get your classes paid for. So at least you're working towards something because you're doing it anyways. You might as well be getting like, you know, you might as well be documenting it. Sure, so, yeah. you know, and that, that was like, that was the beginning. And in 2010 is when I'm like, okay, well, I'm gonna go back to school. And so I started going back to school. And, um, right around that time is George, you know, George says, Hey, I'm, he changed, you know, he, his whole perspective too. He wanted to get really more active in, in doing something, you know, productive with his music. Not, I'm not saying he's not doing it. He's like one of those productive guys I know, but in terms of like, um, addressing injustices in the world. And, and like he says, at the beginning of the documentary, you know, he wants to be proud of his culture. He wants to be proud of his country. You know what I mean? And just like anybody else. And he wants to understand how we got to certain places. Um, and so he was describing this, this idea for a movie to me and this drummer that he had. And, you know, the drum, uh, the bass player that he originally was going to get was busy. He was, he couldn't do it. So he's like, look, we're going to be filming just a trailer for this documentary that we're doing. You know, you probably would be perfect for it. Just, in, you know, just in terms of your look too, you know what I mean? Like, you, you know, I played with you before, you know, and you, you seem to be on the social justice trip, you know? So, <laughs> you know, maybe you'd be interested in doing this. And I'm like, yeah, of course, you know? So I drove out to, um, what was it? Uh, Lone Pine, um, you know, in California and it's just like out in the Thule's. And so we filmed this and, you know, we're just talking about things and it, it, we just hit it off. I mean, you know, like we're totally on the same page on a bunch of different things. Um, he saw where I was mentally sober and focused and studying and trying to make a difference. And he was just like, you gotta, 
you got to be the bass player in this. You know, you, you're the perfect guy for this. Would you, would you want to do it? So I'm like, of course, you know, he's like, but it's going to require your time. We're going to be going out and interviewing people. And, you know, obviously the more we talked, the more excited and hyped and amped we got on each other, you know, like, Oh man, well, wait till we do this. And when do we do this? And well, you should address this. Okay. Well, do you want to talk to this person? Do you want me to talk to this person? You know what I mean? And so we started figuring this out. Um, and, and then it just, you know, it became this, this whole other thing. It was great. You know, it was great to build with him and I had the opportunity that he gave me to, to like, I mean, go hang out with these, these monumental activists, man, like that, that are part of, you know, American history. I mean, like in between, um, you know, marching with American Indian movement to, you know, John Trudell and going to Alcatraz and, you know, going, traveling all of the United States, going to these different Native American reservations, you know, it was, uh, it was a humongous learning experience that changed everything for me, you know? So, I mean, it was, I was, it was great. It was perfect. And finally, you know, we're finally done with it. So hopefully you can see it. <laughs> and how do you feel? Like It sounds like one of those projects, you come out slightly different than you go, than you went in. How do you feel coming out of that project? Uh, it was great. I mean, like I, I feel super revitalized. I have a, a different perspective on, um, I mean, lots of things. Cause you know, when I was, what I was studying in school through my whole process too was, you know, anthropology, I was originally doing that, cultural anthropology. So it was perfect, like studying Native American cultures and, and studying indigenous peoples, the people that were originally here in America, people that were, that evolved here, like for thousands of years and how their societies worked. Um, and then obviously, you know, Western Europeans came in and a whole, it was a whole other way of living, um, you know, and so being able to compare my studies with traveling and seeing firsthand you know, and also just being a musician and working in a corporate band um, where I play in casinos and, and go to Native American reservations in that capacity. And I see how much money some of them make. You know what I mean? I see how much money is generated. And then, but then going and going to the poorest Native American communities and seeing how poor they are, like third world America, where you wouldn't even believe that this is in the United States. You'd just be blown away that this is happening. I mean, anything from... You know, I mean, just people living, I mean, in squalor or just having no options really um, to, you know, the, these really, really wealthy casinos and these guys making tons of money. And, you know, and then also just the, the other flip side is these poor, these kids that, that are getting like checks for 10 grand from the government, you know, and, and they're just complete drug addicts and just wasting this money. And, and it's so frustrating because they don't have a tie to the culture. They're not trying to preserve anything and they have, you know, they, they kind of just fell off and that, that money has made enable them to actually just destroy themselves, which is like, that's a whole other side of it, you know? Um, so, I mean, it's, it's been, it's been really, a, it's been dark, you know, at times and it's been, um, but you know, I, I, there's a lot of positive things coming out of it because, it, you know, one of the guys says, you know, the existence is the resistance just the mere fact of existing uh, is one of the things that, that keeps them going and that their culture can still, you know, thrive in their, in their communities and certain, you know, traditions and values that they have that we don't find out here in, you know, state Western society that they can continue with their kids and that we can learn a lot from. So, I mean, I picked up a lot from them, you know, and, and just made me question things that I believe, you know what I mean? And stuff that, you know, that, that, so the way I think society should be run. And I'm just like, well, wait a minute, maybe it doesn't have to go like that. You know what I mean? Like maybe the whole goal is not to do that. You know what I mean? Maybe the goal will be something else. Why don't I enjoy my life? You know, and it, it, there's just all kinds of different things. So it, it's, uh, it's really been an eye opening experience and uh, hopefully, you know, people will get the same thing out of it or nothing, you know, people will get something substantial out of it when they see it. And the soundtrack for that is another mammoth project. Of course, doing any documentary is a mammoth project, and this one sounds no different. But the sound, even just the soundtrack, sounds huge. Can you tell me a bit about that one? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, when we first started the project, we had Vinny Castro playing drums, and you know, Greg and I, uh, uh, he's always been the singer, and then Donnie Dickman, and then obviously George and myself, and you know, we got together and we were kind of just feeling it out. We didn't know what we were going to do either. It's you know, we, it was kind of like just getting in a room and let's just write some stuff. And, you know, and it was the first time, the first like batch of tunes we wrote were pretty eclectic. We even had DJs and, and other producers come in and create these big monumental beats with just sampling George's guitar parts. And then I'd go back and lay down kind of like almost synth bass parts over it. Um, 
and then we had, you know, actually I brought in one of my really good friends, Monty Smith. He's this uh, activist who I've actually learned a lot from. Um, you got him on the first album on the song called Sue Wake Up. He's a spoken word street. He calls himself like a street poet. And he's a, uh, and so, you know, having those kind of aspects too with John Trudell, he was on another track too. So that was the first volume. Actually it was the second volume because like on the CD, the newer stuff we wrote is actually volume one. Um, and that was the first batch. And then as we kept going on, you know, and years, like literally years went by because we started in 2011. By 2013, 2014, we're like, uh, okay, well, we're like different people now and we're more cohesive. We're, and by this point, you know, uh, Jimmy DeAndre's playing drums, um, who George knew, you know, obviously he plays the Lynch Mob and Bullet Boys and all that stuff like that. And then I'd never played with before. And so I got in the room with Jimmy and we hit it off. I mean, he's my brother, that guy. I love that guy like to death. Um, he's also clean too. So I mean, I have that whole, that whole other dynamic of, of having a clean mindset and, and focused. And, uh, and so that was really cool. And so as a solidified bad, we went back and started writing more stuff. We all started taking part in the lyric writing as well, because there's certain messages we felt we needed to get across, especially after going to places like white clay and, and, you know, going to South Dakota and, and, and Alcatraz and stuff like that. There's certain things that needed to be talked about. And so we, we uh, all had a hand in lyric writing. The riffs are heavier. Um, the beats are really big. Uh, you know, obviously Jimmy's hard hitter. I mean, the first rehearsal we played, he broke three snare heads. Um, I mean, that was, and that was, that was a rehearsal. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. you know, that's, you know, that stuff doesn't happen. Um, and so, uh, I mean, that was, that was a whole different thing. That was a whole other monster. And so when we put together that batch of songs, it was, uh, you know, it felt a little more cohesive and it felt a little bit more, uh, um, focused, you know what I mean? Like the lyrics and, and everything else was, was a lot more focused and we were together. But I mean, have you, did you hear it? Have you heard it yet? I love it. It's great. Cool. I'm glad you like it. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, and I, I've been so far like, and from the shows and, and the, and the videotaping that we've done, you know, and the, um, the, uh, just from the filming and, and the, the, you know, the few gigs we did do we met a lot of people and they couldn't wait for the stuff to come out so it was kind of cool because we almost like created a like a small little fan base just for making the movie before the albums even came out so right. pe people knew what to expect and then you know obviously like me like i'm on like every social network so i've met like so many people i mean you know we stayed with people the navajo nation we stayed with people in in, in south dakota uh we met people in alcatraz like we stayed with so many different people and, and met everybody along the road that like they got to see the progression of the band as well as the music and, and we're waiting for this release date. So it was cool. We actually, the suspense and like the, um, the opportunity to create this online presence before we even released anything was, I think it helped out a lot. And do you think this band's going to play any more shows? Man, I, I hope so. I mean, uh, I think George wasn't quite sure at first, but right, I mean, it's, I mean, the album seems like it's doing really good right now. I mean, it was like number nine on Amazon's bestseller list like last week, um, and it had only been out for three days. So if like things continue like that, I think that um, I think we, you know, we'll, we'll do some shows because people will want to see it. You know, we'll have an audience that'll come on just play. You know what I mean? Because <laughs> you know, it's like there's no point going on tour if nobody cares or even wants to hear the music. So. And and George is probably a bit of a tight spot because he's got the new Lynch Mob record and he's touring with them right now. So there's, there's yeah. only so much, only so much time for him too. I mean, it, it, considering he's, you know, I mean, he's also got KXM. He's also got the Infidel. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like he works like insanity. Like he goes and goes and goes and goes, man. It's, it's crazy. And what about you? What's next for you? Are you going to do another solo record? Yeah. Well, I've been working on that. I mean, there's just so much stuff going on because, you know, I'm working on, I'm, pretty heavily with the hip hop community. Like I work with one of the oldest hip hop organizations in the world, uh, the, the universal Zulu nation. And what that does is like, uh, it, it really, it's, it's, it was formed by gang lords in, in the South Bronx and New York in the seventies. Um, and what it, they did was they unified gangs and they unified the youth to do productive stuff in the inner cities and, uh, and focus on creative things as opposed to shooting each other in the streets and doing drugs. Um, and so, I work with, with the Universal Zoo Nation. I'm moving up in ranks um, very soon in that. And, I mean, you know, these different opportunities come up to me. Like, I, I just ended up, like, in December, 
uh, you know, like last December, I worked with the U.S. State Department actually doing a cultural exchange um, with these hip hop artists from Tunisia and Egypt. They came out and, um, you know, we talked to them about Zulu Nation. We talked, we actually made one of them officially Zulu. And, uh, and these guys are, you know, it's a whole other monster over there. Obviously it, it's uh, cause here we're stopping kids from doing drugs and joining gangs over there. They're literally stopping kids from jump, jumping the, the Syrian border to join ISIS. Um, right. so it's like, yeah. you know, you know what I mean? It, it's heavy, heavy stuff. Um, yeah. and, and so it, it's cool to be, you know, I, I had, that was one of the things that I did like in December and then, um, I'm, I'm trying to release another vital nonsense album and through most recently, I, I made some other connections. Like I played with Andy Summers from the police, uh, Andy Summers confirmed he's going to play on it. I'm doing another album with, uh, Prashana Swani, the virtuoso guitar player, another ESP guy and, uh, myself and Jose Basias from, um, Incubus, the band Incubus is playing drums. And so, um, we're doing, we're doing another Prashana Swani album. Uh, I'm working on my own album and then, um, you know, doing this stuff with Zulu and the Guerrilla Republic, which is an indigenous rights people's movement. And then actually I'm starting school in September because I'm focusing on criminology. Like I, I want to try to work to get uh, maybe affect some kind of legislation or get nonviolent drug offenders out of jail. Um, just people that, you know, that are taking up space in jail that are really not a harm to society that just need um, treatment. You know what I mean? Because, um, I mean, the stats are pretty out there, you know, I mean, over 50% of the people in the prison population have substance abuse problems. And while they're locked up, less than 2% actually even get treated. So they just get thrown back out on the street. It's a perpetual cycle that costs taxpayers billions of dollars. But, you know, it makes it makes a specific demographic of people lots of money. That's what private prisons are for. They they make people money. Um, and, you know, there's all kinds of investors in that. Uh, so, like, that's one of my big goals. And so, I mean, on, on top of you know, the different music projects and recording and, and gigs. Um, I got, I got school coming up in September. So that's, I'm going to be a junior there, hopefully graduating from UCI in, in, in 2017. So, so much stuff going on, man. <laughs> <laughs> so you're, what you're saying is that you need a hobby cause you you got a lot of free time. Yeah. There's nothing. I mean, yeah, I know exactly. I should pick up surfing. That's so funny. <laughs> That was Gabe Rosales. Thanks for listening. The Shadow Train soundtrack is available now on Rat Pack Records. I have links up where you can buy it at thedoublestop.com. I also have links for a solo record if you want to check that out as well. That's it for this week. I'm Brian Sword. Thanks for listening.